stay-at-home dad Watching Disney movies he never had His daughter digs through all the VHS Crushing the classics in a princess dress Informed like Scuttle, Kurt's got your ticket Making it real like Jiminy Cricket Most are off the cap and hook, but if the Tweedledum He'll be taking more shots than Bambi's mom Leave some raise like Simba, or crack like the Beast dishes He'll show you a whole new world You won't need pre-wish Stay at home, Disney Dad Oh, it's time. It's time. It's melody time. There's a little big Van Vader joke if you're paying attention this morning. Okay, I'm a dad. Lots of things make me feel old. Melody time wonderfully, however, makes me feel young. I don't even know what to do with melody time. This is like Walt Disney's garage sale, and I feel bad knocking this movie, but this journey is about honesty. And I'm watching this the same time as other classics like Cinderella and The Little Mermaid, so honestly, how can this hold up? It's a collection of random shorts with no connective or wraparound narrative. And each standalone story is completely forgettable, like utterly forgettable. Each short is introduced with gusto and fanfare as the narrator lists the talent involved in the production. But other than Roy Rogers and his horse trigger, I don't recognize any of them, not a single one. Again, not their fault. I'm sure this was a big deal back in the day. But staying relevant is a big check mark as I watch all these old outings in the present day. Okay, I feel like I should be excited. But I'm only annoyed as I steady myself for a group called the Andrew Sisters, harmonizing about a tugboat for nearly five full minutes. Again, I fully realize more than anything the blame lands squarely on nothing more than the passage of time because if I was around in 1948, I'm sure this would have been a big deal. I would have appreciated this project for the avalanche of celebrities it included. This is probably like a 1948 version of Love Actually, but this collection of animated shorts has aged poorly, like terribly, awfully. When I write these reviews, I try extremely hard to keep my personal views uncontaminated and stay away from Wikipedia and other sources unless I have a burning question that needs to be answered for the sake of the review. Melody Time was the first exception to that rule. I needed to know why Melody Time was even a thing. So I had to Google it, I Wikipedia it, and okay, wow. I kind of assumed this movie's only redeeming quality would be that it was a loose blueprint for the future release of the ultra successful movie Fantasia, but nope. Melody Time came after Fantasia, and that is insanity. Wikipedia also tells me Melody Time is a compilation of feature films that were previously released during the dark years the world was at war. In 1948, Walt decided to gather them together and release them as a full-length movie with the hopes of it generating enough revenue to allow them to direct, quote, return to fairy tale single narrative feature form, and thank God they did, forever running far, far away from this setup. So basically, Melody Time was nothing more than a cash grab, and these shorts were never intended to be forced together like this. I guess I can respect that on a monetary business decision level, but geez, there is just nothing worth revisiting with this one. I'm sorry. Regardless, let's do it. Here I go. Willingly into visual solitary confinement. The first short is called Once Upon a Winter Wonderland, and it features a dorky young man and a Disney beautiful young woman going ice skating together. No spoken dialogue. Instead, Francis Langford sings a ditty over top the entire cartoon. There's a danger and a rescue. And I'm 100% uninvested. They can both fall through the ice. I don't care. End the segment, really. <sighs> Yawn. Move on. Up next, you just know you're in for a treat with the title Bumble Boogie. Musically, Freddie Martin leads an orchestra while visually a bumblebee dodges angry music notes like actual floating music notes. Before now, only ever seen written on actual paper, yet here they are, somehow grown a third dimension, become sentinel and hostile. They see this insect and decide it has to die. They're not so they make a beeline for his head, self high five, and try to take this little critter out. A bumblebee is dodging murderous music notes. This is happening, people, and I'm far too lowbrow to appreciate this on some sort of conceptual level. Like, the bee is on tablature, and I feel like I'm on acid because these two worlds are on an impossible collision. Next, we have The Legend of Johnny Appleseed. The third installment is a Dennis Day narrating the story of Johnny Appleseed. I'm hopeful this one might break the streak and actually have a story arc. Jay is a simpleton with a pot on his head, and 17 minutes later he dies and becomes an angel, and I can only hope he ends up being one of Corey Feldman's angels. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I was watching this all day yesterday. Search Corey Feldman and the angels go for it, and you are forever welcome. All right, 17 minutes of my life gone. Let the punishment fit the crime. Let's keep going. Next is Little Toot, where the previously mentioned Andrew sisters sing a bland ditty about a tiny tugboat, tragically named 
a little toot. Flatulence apparently wasn't funny until the 1950s. From start to finish, it's a shameless ripoff of the little engine that could and exploits the I think I can, I think I can mantra. Little toot ends up saving the day and tows us like impossibly large ship to safety. And I've started watching that Corey Feldman video again between these segments, and by comparison, I'm now convinced Corey Feldman is a brilliant artistic visionary. Let's give him a Disney movie. The second last segment is Blame It on the Samba, and it reunites the three caballeros who have their own bizarre full-length Disney movie that plays out like a promotional travel video for Mexico, and don't worry folks, that mind bender is already in the queue ready to go. Much like their own movie titled The Three Caballeros, for the six of you that are still watching this, the three animated ducks are pasted over top live scenes with real actors and actresses, this time they shake their animated booty alongside Ethel Smith while she saw the sight lines between the real and fake almost line up. Credit for ambitiously trying this back in 1948, but this ain't no who framed Roger Rabbit. This one is thankfully done quickly as I'm looking at my watch and that Feldman video again. You got nothing to lose, baby, so go for it. Let's go for it. You certainly well for it, Mr. Feldman, and I'm thankful you did. And finally, we close with Picos Bill. This is narrated by a live Roy Rogers and some of his friends sitting around a legit campfire. But as the story begins, we jump into the animated portion where we meet Picos Bill. Now, as a baby, Bill fell off the wagon, and thank God I'm not a recovering addict myself, as Melody Time would probably have made me fall off my own wagon as well. That was funny. Bill was then raised by coyotes or coyotes, which beautifully explains why he can ride a horse so well. Speaking of his horse, his horse is named Widowmaker, credit where it's due, that's a badass horse name. After spinning their wheels, really driving home the point that he is just so manly and unstoppable, he sets his testosterone-soaked eyes on a cowgirl riding a giant fish and is instantly impressed. As the fish skips along the water, her skirt bounces up and down, revealing her 1940 bloomers, and for the first time in this movie, I have something to write about. Her name is Slewfoot Sue, and against the mundane look and feel of the other short movies, I can't express how oddly sexual the scene feels, nor fathom I why this was added and or approved. Old Bill didn't even know he was into gals on aquatic life forms and has just stopped dead in his tracks. He has never seen anything like this before, and come to think of it, neither have I. And I'm as curious as the rest of you to see where this is going. Okay, they fall in love, he professes his love to her, and as she finally kisses him atop a mountain, his guns pop out and their holsters they pop out of the holsters and they go from like 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock and start firing. Subtle. I'm at a complete loss, people. Bill and Sue prepare for marriage and, you know, no, just I can't move past this. I gotta Google this again, sorry. Okay, in 1948, those prematurely firing pistols have to have been as scandalous as the Sharon Stone's basic instinct interrogation scene. This, yeah, there it was. There was controversy with the guns and the animators, quote, Slipped one past the censors, and holy jumping sexy fish ladies in the unedited version, Pico's Bill is smoking a cigarette. At one point, he jumps into a tornado and lights his smoke with lightning. Hot damn, this guy's a manly man. Yeah, the cigarette was meticulously edited out of the VHS release, which is complete bull crap, but okay. They're fit to be wed, and Bill promises Sue a ride on the jealous Widowmaker, who ends up bucking Sue to the moon. Did you catch that? His horse bucked Sue to the moon. She dead. Broken-hearted Picos Bill returns to live with the coyotes and here it comes. Bill is responsible for why coyotes howl at the moon. That's the takeaway folks and that took longer to get there than it needed to. And with the fade to black, I can't push melody time back to the bottom of this VHS bin fast enough. Exhale. It is what it is and I get it. This lazy release did in fact finance their next major project as two years later they dropped the mega successful Cinderella onto the world and hopefully Walt took a nice hot shower and scrubbed away melody time like I'm about to but first more Corey freaking Feldman I don't know what to say this clip has hijacked my life but the YouTube view numbers tell a different story I've watched this so many times the guy is dressed like a vampire dances like Michael Jackson and has a band made up of supermodels dressed in cheap angel costumes it's it's perfect on every level That's what I think of what do you think? What we have is a concern about Curtis Anderson. His interviewing style is not the best. His personal appearance is not the best. I was wondering if the man has some kind of a hold over the channel that uh, he's allowed to be employed for so long 